sorry about that. So it turns out the Wi-Fi where I'm staying is not so great. Uh, I went on the Wi-Fi specifically to avoid that. Um, so the real question that I wanted to answer today was really um, how did I get well? Basically, that's I think the question that everybody is um, interested in and it's the one that honestly I would like to talk about is how I got from there to here and the reason I want to talk about that is because what I hear a lot of is people really stuck in their diagnosis, stuck in their problems, stuck in their prognosis so your diagnosis is what they've labeled you with. Your prognosis is what they've told you your future is going to be. And there's this um, beautiful quote by Deepak Chopra in a, um, a documentary that I watched where he says, you can accept your diagnosis from the doctor, but you don't have to accept your prognosis. And I thought that was really valuable um, because... And, and, and I, want, I want to just make a caveat, all right? I have not done this video and have not done this live and have not talked about this publicly. Um, I've had lots of conversations one-to-one -one on this topic, but I was apprehensive about putting it out in the public because of the potential backlash. And that potential backlash comes from people that are going to call me a snake oil merchant, that are going to say it's too good to be true, that are going to say, I've been told by three different doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, that I have PTSD, there's nothing I can do about it, and this is how it is. Hi, Dane. Um, had some issues with my network, so we've started again. Um, and if you're that person, if you're so attached to your diagnosis of PTSD and your prognosis of you are going to have this for the rest of your life and the best you can hope for is managing it and you buy into that, you believe that, hey bud, then maybe you're not ready for this conversation. Not you, Dane, people who think that. People who have bought into their prognosis People that have bought into the story that the best you can hope for is to manage your condition. Um, if you feel like you want to own your PTSD and you want to wear it as a badge of honor and you're going to carry that PTSD jacket around the rest of your life because that's your, that's your thing that you've earned because of what you've been through and you want to hold on to it with a really tight grip, then you go ahead. I've got no issue for that. But this is not... The conversation for you. This is the conversation for the people that go, fuck you, you and your label. I'm not interested in your labels. I'm interested in getting well. I'm interested in being the person that I want to be. Not necessarily the person I was before, maybe even a better version of myself because of what I've been through. A more resilient version, a stronger version, a version of me that sees the world from a different point of view because of my experiences and because of what I have overcome. If you're that person, then this is the conversation for you. All right, there is this thing in psychology that we call secondary gain. Secondary gain is people that are, uh, is the reason that people hang on so tight. And I have some theories about the secondary gain of PTSD and I was discussing this at a, at a function uh, and I found myself talking to an ex-AFP and uh, TASPOL officer, I believe he was. And we were talking about tribe and the value of tribe. And I know after over a decade in the ambulance industry, nearly 15 years in the ambulance industry overall, um, tribe is super important, all right? We know that we wanna be with the same people, we speak the same language, we use the same shortcuts, we can use the same dark black humor and whether your tribe has been a military tribe or a police tribe or an ambulance tribe or a fiery tribe or um, um, 
tow truck drivers you know there's there's whatever your tribe is and for a lot of us it's tied to our our profession it's what we do uh doctors nurses you know that's a tribe you you went through the same schooling experience or similar schooling experience you do the same thing day in day out you can speak the same language you laugh at the same jokes um and there's conversations you can have with people in your tribe that you can't really have with people outside of your tribe and when you lose that, when you lose that tribe due to mental illness, you get excluded from the tribe. You're now no good, you don't work properly, you're broken, right? And you get chucked out of the tribe because you don't serve that purpose anymore. That is devastating. Being disowned by your tribe is being really, it's, is devastating. Secondary to that, is we go on the hunt. We go on the hunt and we start looking for another tribe. Well, who will have us now? If we can't be with our people, who are our new people? And we're looking for a new tribe. We're looking for new people to, to hang out with and to spend time with. And I think, unfortunately, often what can happen is that people move from their tribe that's attached to their uniform and their role they move and the next tribe that is made available to them is the tribe of the sick, the tribe of the diagnosed, the tribe of the PTSD sufferer. And we cling to that because these people speak our language. They're fighting the same fights. We're having the same arguments. We're angry at the same sorts of people. The um, insurance companies, the employers, that shared anger that gives us some common ground to be with those people. The point of a tribe in a real sort of, you know, traditional kind of way is for survival, is for everybody in the tribe to be fed, to have enough water, to be safe, to have shelter, and to grow and prosper. My concern is that if you join a tribe of sick people that are stuck in their problem, they're not helping you grow or prosper or advance. They're not nourishing you. Does that make sense? So if you're watching this on replay, can you just um, let me know that you are watching this on replay and let me know what you think. Hello, Narissa. I'm so sorry we haven't caught up um, as much as I would have liked this year. I miss you terribly on a daily basis. You're an amazing human being. So I think part of the issue with people being stuck in their diagnosis and more seriously their prognosis is that they find a tribe they find their tribe of the miserable and I think that's a shame because that's not the only tribe that there is out there for you there is a tribe of people that have moved through their diagnosis and the prognosis of PTSD and related anxiety and depression there is a tribe of people that have solutions that are far more focused on solutions rather than staying in the problem. And this was really one of the biggest shifts that I had in my recovery that was responsible for moving me into a space of recovery was having gaining an understanding that I had that option. I had that option of moving into a space of recovery and that there were other people that I could spend time with um, that had moved through this and that had solutions. So um, I do encourage you to look at who you are surrounding yourself with who are the people around you are they feeding you are they nourishing you are they helping you prosper are they helping you grow or are you around people that say they're supportive 
but they don't challenge you. They potentially, they indulge you in your story, in your diagnosis, in your symptoms, rather than being the sort of person that's going to challenge you and ask you some really great questions. Um, questions like, how is it helping you to stay where you are? How are you growing staying where you are? Questions like that. So I have learnt all of this and I've moved through PTSD. Now for those that doubt me, I fit the DSM, I was diagnosed, my psychologist said I had it, uh, I lost my job because of it, uh, I got a disability pension for two years because of it. I absolutely, definitely did have PTSD. Within that, within that, I had what we call the shitty trifecta and I had anxiety and depression. And to be honest, I had a kid uh, probably in the middle of all of this and I probably had some postnatal depression. But to be honest, it was so lost in everything else that was going on that it was never recognized and never dealt with. And my son's now seven um, and I'm, a, I'm good now. Uh, but I think that was sort of all in the mix as well. I don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. I still get angry. I still yell at my kids. I still get frustrated at shitty drivers. I'm not a perfect human being, but I'm not bound by my diagnosis. I'm not bound by my prognosis. Hello, Lee. I just... It was brought to my realization, it was brought to my awareness that I had choices. I had a choice about how I could define my life. I had a choice about how I could define my future. And a, a, a diagnosis is not a life sentence. And so I wanted to ask the question, well, what happens if I don't want this? I got put on a disability pension at 34 years old. 34? I'd like plan to at least live till 68. I wasn't even halfway through my life. And somebody said, you've got this disability. Here's, you can, don't have to go to work. We'll pay you to not go to work. You can just sit on the couch. And do what? I sat on that couch. I tried it on. I tried it out. I sat there for at least three months. Me and the couch got real close. And it reached a point where I was like, no, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't want my kids to walk past me on the couch and see me as another piece of furniture. I don't want to not be engaged in their day-to-day -day lives. I don't want them to think, poor mummy. Poor mum. Look at her. She doesn't do anything. She just feels miserable. I felt sorry for myself, but I didn't want anybody to feel sorry for me. And maybe that's just my personality. Maybe I'm just a stubborn bitch. And if my husband was still on, he would probably be agreeing. <laughs> but I think that's a good thing. I think that helped me pull myself out of that. And I reached a point where I thought, you know what? This is not okay. This will not do. And I started looking around. I started looking for stuff. Hello, Sarah. Um, I started looking for stuff um, to get better. Now, I developed PTSD, anxiety and, and depression whilst on antibiotics, uh, antidepressants, antidepressants. I'd been on antidepressants for most of my career for about eight years and I got very unwell whilst still taking them. Um, that said to me, and I, I tried different ones, uh, not just the same one, but I, for me, I knew deep down that medicine, medication, pharmaceuticals was not the solution for me. I didn't want to just put different drugs in my body and hope that it was the right one and deal with the side effects. I tried that a little bit and... Uh, I very quickly realized that that was not the pathway for me. 
Um, and so I started looking for other stuff. I ended up um, over a period of time hearing about this thing called neuro-linguistic programming and I discovered some people that uh, had done coaching, coaching training and in that coaching training they had studied NLP and neuro-linguistic programming is really teaching you how to think about thinking and it's also about modeling success. So NLP was born out of the psychology, positive psychology movement in the 60s and 70s in California in the United States. It was really born from that. And what it says is it looks at one area of your life where you have a problem and rather than delving and doing a deep dive into the problem, um, coaching via NLP says, or, or using NLP as a modality says, what areas of your life are working? What's working for you? And how can we map across the parts of your life that are working for you and map that over your actions, your thoughts, your beliefs around the things that are working well? How can we map that across to the parts of your life that are not working so well? And so it's really about modeling those successful behaviors, those successful actions, those thought patterns that uh, lift you up and progress you forward and how can we adapt those into the areas and not doing so well so we're always calibrating we're always looking for well you know how is that area of your life out of 10 oh that's seven cool well, what are you doing in the seven that you're not doing in the area of life that you've scored three and maybe what are some of those things that we can take from the seven and we can put into the three area and we can boost that three up so that's sort of you know in a really simple way the way that coaching with a uh, NLP informed coaching can start asking questions about how can we look at this differently rather than going into the area that's three and look at all the reasons that it's three and why is it three and how long has it been three I trust that my clients they know their problem they know their problem in and out. They know the edge of the problem. They know the causes of the problem. They know what triggers the problem. Um, so for example, if their problem is um, nightmares or um, hyper alertness, so being um, you know, a bit on edge, can't go into public spaces, easily triggered for panic attacks and anxiety, things like that. They will know what causes that for them. It's large crowds. It's um, beeping, you know, things that beep. It's, um, they'll be quite specific. They'll go, these are the things that trigger me. Um, my mother-in-law. There'll be particular people as well that will trigger them and they'll know that. And so um, potentially how this differs from some other talk based therapies is we don't really talk about the problem all that much unless we are eliciting some information to use that in a process to work towards a solution so we're very much solution based so nlp taught me how to change the way i was looking at my problem the first thing that came into my awareness somebody made me realize that i had an option was i was introduced to the idea of cause and effect i can be at effect um so everything has cause and effect i can be at effect of outside external sources right so i can be at effect of the weather or the traffic all right, sorry I was late. Uh, the traffic was really bad. There are a couple of car accidents on the road on the way in. Would be a statement of somebody that was responding at effect. Or, and don't get me wrong, most people are unaware of the choice and are living at effect without an awareness that they actually have an option. So when you live at effect, you are essentially giving away your power. You're externalizing your power. Uh, I, my mantra was, I can't because. I can't exercise because I have fibromyalgia, which I had in relationship to my PTSD. I can't 
do that because of my PTSD. I can't take the kids to the shops. I can't go and do the grocery shopping because it freaks me out and I don't want to be around people. I can't, I had a whole lot of I can't statements uh, because of PTSD, fibromyalgia, my triggers, my anxiety, my panic attacks, um, everything else that was going on. I, I can't live my life the way I want because of those things. And ultimately what you're doing when you're making those statements is you are voluntarily disempowering yourself. Now it's only voluntary if you know you have a choice. So when it was brought to my realization that I had a choice and I could become what we refer to as being at cause, being at cause for my life, which is, I'm sorry the traffic was bad, I should have left the house half an hour earlier, right? That person is at cause. Being at cause is not about blame, it's about responsibility. And in my mind, most importantly, being a cause is an opportunity to take a status of empowerment. Because once you are empowered and you are a cause and I believe that I am in charge of my life. Well, if I have that power, then I'm going to change the bits that don't work for me. It's really that simple. Simple, not easy. Simple. Thank you, Lee. That's debatable. So, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Um, so, that revelation that I could be empowered, I could have a choice about how this affected my life and how I was going to respond to it, that blew my mind. That blew my mind when I heard it. And then the question was asked of me, how would you like it to be? What sort of statements would you like to be saying about yourself? What? I had never considered this. Nobody, nobody had asked me that before. What do I want? How would I like it to be? I would like to be an engaged parent. I would like to be present in the moment, not reminiscing about the best times of my career in the past. I would like to be happy. I'd like to laugh. I would like to have joy and fun in my life. Shit, I really had to think about it because for a long time I didn't know that was an option anymore. I didn't know what I wanted mattered and I was so caught up in what I didn't want that I actually didn't know what I wanted. I really had to sit back and think about it. And if, if you're in that position, if you're in that, you know, stuck knee deep in your shit position... <laughs> I know you don't want to be in the shit. I know you don't like the smell. I know that it makes all your friends leave because you need deep in shit. So I want you to start thinking about what you would like it to be like instead. That simple shift of going from how do you not want it to be and actually start getting your brain thinking about what do I want things to be like. That is a powerful shift because you immediately start thinking of possibility and potential and opportunity. And it's very hard to, it's certainly more difficult to stay stuck in your shit when you're thinking about possibility and you're dreaming about what things could be like. That will inherently lift your state lift your presence, lift your mood. NLP taught me to think differently. NLP pushed me to ask myself different questions. And now that's what I do with clients. It gave me a new perspective on life. I learnt through doing several levels of NLP training 
to enter the world in a different way. It gave me two important things, which I think I'd lost. I had at some point, but I think I'd lost. And the first important thing that I had lost was compassion. Compassion. For those of us in medical roles, helping roles, healing roles, doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, medics, um, massage therapists, kinesiologists, healing roles, Let me know in the, in the comments, even if you're watching this later on, let me know, did anyone ever tell you when you were in training for whatever your role is, did anyone tell you, explain to you the difference between compassion and empathy? Because when I was in ambulance training at the turn of the century, Nobody taught me that. Nobody taught me the difference between compassion and empathy. And I think it's a really important distinction. I'm going to share it with you now. Hi, now. And in my mind, the simple distinction is boundaries. Boundaries are really important. Empathy often has no boundaries. Empathy is... I am going to feel your pain with you. I'm going to take it on board into myself and I'm going to be there with you because I am empathetic. And I did that for 10 years, not realizing that taking on other people's grief and other people's pain and other people's sorrow wasn't actually making me better at my job. It was just destroying me from the inside. It didn't actually take anything away from their experience of grief or pain or sorrow. I can't minimize that for them by adopting it into myself. It doesn't work that way. All I did was make myself really sick. So conversely, compassion is I am here in this moment 100% with you for your pain, for your sorrow, for your loss. It's being very clear about what is my shit and what is your shit. And it's not nasty, it's not mean, it's not I don't care. It is exactly that, it is I care, I care deeply. But I also recognize that it is not mine. And I think that part of what would help with this epidemic, this crisis that we have in our emergency services in particular with PTSD is that nobody is teaching this difference. You do not have to take on other people's shit to be good at your job. In fact, in fact, all it does is break you down and potentially minimize your ability to continue in that career that you love so much with the drive that you love so much that you want to stay in. It will just break you. Your clients, your patients, the people that need your help, they don't need you to break down on the inside. They just need you to listen and be there for them. And that is compassion, not empathy. All right, so we need to practice clearer boundaries. We need to talk about protecting self and self-compassion. Having compassion for self is huge. And my beautiful friend, Carissa Lane, up in Brisbane, is an expert in self-compassion. She's made it her thing because we're so bad at it. <laughs> Especially those of us in healthcare and parenting roles. You know, we put ourselves at the bottom of the list and everybody else comes first or second or third and we're like 27th. 
you, we have to take care of ourselves better to be able to be the best version of ourselves for everybody else. Self-compassion is compassion for everybody else. Looking after yourself gives you the ability to look after other people. You know, it's that old story. You can't pour from an empty cup. You've got to fill your cup. And this is a work in progress for me, right? I am not the master, all right? Anybody that knows me will tell you. Um, it's been incremental. People, my Me coming up in my, in my own uh, importance list, it's been an incremental shift, and I'm not at the top yet. Uh, and one mentor of mine, the incredible Joe Wise, when I first started this journey, we were in a weekend, and she said to us, I practice extreme self-care. And because of where I was with my mindset at the time, I thought, oh my God, she's so selfish. Because that was my values. My values were you put everybody else first and then you look after yourself. How dare you? And I judged her according to my values and my map of what was important, what was the decent thing to do. Now my map has shifted, my values have shifted and I look to her and I look to somebody that says, I practice extreme self-care and I'm like, damn right, how do I get there? I'm working on that. Because I know that when I take the time to self-care, I am a way better version of myself for everybody else around me. Lee says, people in the hole want someone strong. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know if you've seen or, or heard, there's this story that goes around, um, story that goes around in different circles of um, there's somebody in the hole and they're stuck and they need help. And you have various levels of usually in the story, it's usually management and they come to the top of the hole and they throw down some resources or they give some helping hand. And, and the story usually goes, it's usually used by peer support, uh, peer support members of an organization. So peer support police, peer support ambulance. They're awesome. I love peer support, right? Mm -hmm. And the story usually ends with, you know, the peer support person is wearing the same uniform and they're at the top of the hole and they jump down and they get into the hole and the person in the bottom freaks out and goes, oh my God, now we're both stuck. And the peer support person says, no, that's okay. I know how to get out. And it's lovely. But you've got two people in a hole. And so the bit that I like to add to it is explaining the role of coaching. And what coaching does is it makes the person in the hole realize that sitting right next to them in the dark, if they just come out from their huddled up little ball and they put their arms out and they feel beside them, they actually have a torch and they pick up that torch and they click it on and they turn the torch on and they start looking around. And what they realize is that they actually have everything they need to get out of that hole. When they use the torch that is next to them, they actually find they have a rope ladder, they have a pulley, they have the shoes with the stabby things on them to get up the ice, right? They have everything they need, a shovel, rope. They have everything with them that they need to get out of the hole by themselves. But it takes a coach to help you realize that you already had all the resources that you already needed. That's how coaching works. And coaching with a NLP trained coach is next level because we can achieve results so quickly because we work primarily with the subconscious mind, which knows way more than your conscious mind. And I had the benefit of having this work done with me. And in the process of me learning all of this, I did the processes. That's the only way I got well. So it was actually, um, it, I've just had my three year anniversary of being medication free. November 2015 is when I went off all my medication. Uh, antidepressants, 
the pill, um, any any tablets I was on at the time, I was on uh, two, three, four different kinds of pills and I I went off all of them. I am not a doctor. I am not advocating you go cold turkey. I was already on the lowest dose possible. I had already weaned down before I made that decision. Please do not send me comments about how dare I recommend people go off their meds. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is for me, that's where I was at and I knew I didn't want them in my body anymore. That was the right decision for me and I'm not telling you what to do with your life, okay? I'm only sharing my story in the hope that maybe one person goes, you know what? Maybe the label that's been put on me is not the end of the story. Maybe there is an opportunity for me to ask some questions. Get curious. Curiosity is the other thing that was given to me by my NLP study. So number one was compassion, including self-compassion. And number two was curiosity. Curiosity gives me that little moment. You know that little moment where something happens and you can feel your reaction coming up. Maybe you're angry. Maybe it's the welling up of tears. You can feel. So a reaction is almost immediate, but it's not immediate. And if you inject from the moment that thing happens, if you inject in that little space, curiosity, just before you react, and you ask a question, a question like, why is this bothering me? What is it about this person that gives me the shits? Why am I particularly sensitive today? What's going on with me that is making this more annoying than usual? If you ask yourself a question like that and you inject in that gap between moment and reaction. And in that gap in between moment and reaction, you inject curiosity. Then what you do is you learn to respond rather than react. Does that make sense? You have a response rather than a reaction. Now, how many times have your reactions got you in trouble? and cause an argument and made you feel probably shitter later. Probably once or twice. So if you can inject into that gap between the moment and the reaction and inject some curiosity and get a little curious about yourself. What's going on? Why is that such a big deal? What's happening with me? Why today? That curiosity, that little injection of curiosity will enable you to have a far more measured response to whatever the moment is rather than a reaction. I encourage you to try it. Takes a bit of practice. Look for the gap. Let me know how you go. For those of you that watch this, I'd really love in the comments or even if you just post on my page. How are you going? Find the gap. Put a little curiosity in. Ask a question. How's that working? How has it changed things for you? What's different? Because you're putting in a little bit of curiosity. What does that do for you? I'm very interested to know. So, I know I've been mega rambling for like an hour. I don't even know what time it is. Let me see what time it is. Yeah, it's been an hour of rambling. So, as usual, what I wanted to talk about was how I got well. And it was conversations like this that got me well. It was being compassionate to myself and others. It was being curious. It was learning 
to accept myself as I am and knowing that I am always doing the best I can with the resources that I have at the time, as is everybody else. We can only ever do the best we can with what we have at the time. You actually cannot do any more than that. Deep. I also now recognize that my version of the world is not the world. My version of events is not necessarily exactly how it happened. My version of whether today was nice and warm or stinking hot is going to be different for different people because it depends on you your perspective, what you bring to the situation. I like the heat. It's hot, but I'm kind of enjoying it today. It's like 28 degrees or something in Victoria at the moment for those from elsewhere. My husband hates the heat. And as far as he's concerned, it's disgusting and stinking hot. And if he's not in air conditioning, then he's actually melting into a puddle. Weather... The heat or the cold is not the only thing that this occurs with. It actually occurs with everything. Whether you think somebody was pissed off is your interpretation. They might say I wasn't pissed off. Well, you sounded pissed off. Well, yeah, to you, because maybe you were pissed off. Maybe you were looking for them to be pissed off. So maybe when they say, I wasn't pissed off, I was frustrated, or I was afraid, I was scared, and it came out as angry. That's a thing that happens. So if I could expand your mind, open your mind to the idea that maybe, just maybe, your interpretation of events, the way you see the world, is not the truth. It's a truth. And it's your truth, but it's not the truth. And in fact, there is no truth. All we have are differing interpretations of reality. And when you find the people who have similar versions of reality to you, it's easy to talk to them. When you have, find people that have different versions of reality to you, that's when we have arguments. But recognize that it's just their interpretation of reality. These are things I learned through NLP. These are things that I can share with you and teach you if you work with me. These are the conversations I love having, to be honest. Um, depending on how the feedback from this live goes, uh, in terms of how many people actually tune in and watch it uh, afterwards, um, I am super grateful and absolutely blessed for those of you that have tuned in. Um, Sue, Lee, Christy, uh, Nat, Dane. I know there was a few more on before I had technical difficulties. So I absolutely appreciate you for tuning in. Thank you so much. I am hoping this gets a bit of reach and we get the word out that you have options, you have choices. It's not set in concrete. It's not set in stone. PTSD is not a commandment. All right. It's not passed down from the Lord above. You have options. You have choices. And I have evidence. There are many of us that got the same label and now we don't have it anymore. We are not affected. I am not on medication. I do not have panic attacks. I sleep reasonably soundly, lightly, but soundly. I do not have nightmares or flashbacks. I am not hyper alert. I don't have it anymore. Just don't. Hello, Jane, my gorgeous. Long time no see. For those of you that are interested in what I'm doing in 2019, uh, I was hoping that Jazz Rawlinson was going to join us. Um, she clicked going on the event, but it's been a bit dodgy and the time shifted and stuff, so I totally appreciate that maybe that didn't work out for her. She's a very busy 
young lady. So Jazz, as well as being an incredible mother, is also going to help me write my book next year, finally. I think I've been talking about it for at least two years. Um, so she is going to kick me in the butt regularly and keep me on track. And my book, my whole story in far less rambly and uh, more cohesive manner will be getting written in 2019. So I'm super excited and super grateful for Jazz for helping me th with that. Uh, that is her area of expertise and I can't wait to work together and start getting that process underway because I really um, honestly believe that there are people that need to hear the message that you have options, you have choices. Uh, management is not the best you can hope for. Full recovery is the best you can hope for. Uh, and I know that because I've done it and I can show you how to do it and we can do it together. Um, so there's that. Uh, in around August next year, if not before, um, my beautiful friend Russell Cunningham and I am planning to run a NLP training. So if what I have spoken about today has piqued your interest and you are curious about it, then please get in touch uh, any way you've got. So private message, message the page, comment, text me, phone call, uh, however you like. Um, get in touch and let me know that you're interested in that and we will put a seat aside for you and there'll be some more information about that coming along. For those of you in or ex emergency services, I am now speaking directly to you. I am talking to current emergency service workers, whether that is AFP, VicPol, TASPOL, New South Wales, Police, Ambulance, Fire, Queensland, wherever you're from, current or ex-serving members of those services. I am running a weekend retreat in the middle of May. It is the 17th, 18th and 19th of May. Before the end of the week, I will share a landing page for you guys to hit up, a web address for you to go on to and get some details about it. This weekend is for 10 VIPs, 10 only, because I'm going to keep this really small, really intimate. You're going to get a whole lot of work to closely with me. I'm not overrunning the joint. It's going to be a small group of 10. We are going away for a weekend to a beautiful property that I have found in Neerham South at the base of Mount Borbor. We are not going to be sitting in a room for two days filling out workbooks and singing Kumbaya and making spaghetti towers, ice breaking activities. That's not what is happening. Yes, there are workbooks, <laughs> but we're not just doing that stuff for two days. We're going to be doing really amazing activities. We're going to be doing, there's going to be opportunity for bushwalking, high ropes course, low ropes course, um, flying fox, uh, potentially if it's not too freezing cold, maybe some activities on the river. Um, there's, there's heaps of stuff, archery, uh, rock climbing wall, basketball, uh, walks, campfires, depending on the, the weather when we're there. All right. So there's heaps of activities. We're going to be doing stuff physically as well and getting some of that discharge of energy out. So please don't think that it's just two days of sitting in a room listening to the neuropsych of PTSD. We're going to do that just for, you know, a little bit in the morning uh, on one morning. And then after that, we are going to be going away. We have all our accommodation will be included in your package in the price. All our food. So we will be arriving Friday afternoon. So our first meal there is afternoon tea on Friday. Then we have dinner Friday. Breakfast, lunch, dinner uh, Saturday. They're doing a cook a cooked breakfast for us on Sunday. I'm so excited. A proper cooked Sunday breakfast. Uh, and then our final meal will be Sunday lunch. And then we finish up on the Sunday afternoon at about 2 in the afternoon. If that sounds like something you would like to do, to come and suck things from my brain, to come and do some workshop type stuff, get some information. The goal of the weekend is to get a bit of energy out, do some cool activities, meet some people that um, are in a similar position to you and looking for something else. All right, if you're happy sitting at home, taking medication, going to doctor's appointments, that's fine. That works for you, that works for you, that's cool. 
This weekend is really about people that resonate with my message and are looking for a different option. They're looking for something else. If that is you, please send me a message via my Facebook page, Lisa Westgate, NLP for PTSD. Uh, Let me know that you're interested. As I said, I only have 10 spots, all right? We have one beautiful, we're in the historic guest house on this property. It's gorgeous. We're all gonna be in one space. We're away from everybody else. There's heaps of breakout spaces. When you need quiet time, you can have quiet time. Um, So I'm really excited for that. Again, 17th to the 19th of May next year. Prior to that, I'm also looking at doing um, a, a little speaking thing. So whether I do a webinar here or whether I find somewhere in Melbourne to um, do a little half day activity, workshop, um, speaking event, something to sort of introduce you guys to the ideas that we're going to be doing on the weekend. But if you've heard that and you're like, yes, activities and learning and people that get me and options and choices and clarity around where I'm headed in my recovery and what I'll actually focus on what I want to achieve and how I want my life to be, that's what we're doing on the weekend. You will leave with clarity around your journey to recovery and where you're headed and what it is you're actually trying to achieve in that. What are the outcomes that you want for you and for your family, all right? So that's the goal of the weekend as well as hanging out with me and some other really amazing people that have beautiful hearts and went into uniformed roles because they were lovely people. So if that is you, again, get in touch. Otherwise, the book is coming. There's training in August. There will also be more um, speaking and workshop and weekend events. So lots happening in 2019. In the period before that, Christmas and New Year's. I know that everybody says this can be a difficult time, but you know what? It can be a difficult time. All right. There's family, there's obligations, there's this annoying, infuriating, intent, like just expectation of jolliness and cheeriness. And you know what? If you're not feeling jolly and cheery, everyone can fuck off. I felt like that for years. I hated Christmas. Now I recognize it's time to, you know, spend with my family and see my kids, um, you know, enjoy stuff. And that's fun. Beautiful message from Todd Kimber from South Australia. Insomnia, sleep deprivation also plays part in how well we can interpret and react to various situations too. Absolutely. Less means means the sleep means a shorter fuse and faster reactions to triggers than may normally be. I enjoy listening to you, Lisa. Please keep these going. Thank you so much for your gorgeous feedback, Todd. Um, absolutely. The three major issues that people have in PTSD when they call me are their anger response, because we go all the way to 11 straight away. I'm angry all the time. I'm anxious and my sleep is for shit. If you have any of those three problems, anger, anxiety, sleep problems, please let me know. I will send you a free downloadable hypnosis MP3, incredibly effective, particularly listen to it regularly. All right, I'm happy to send you that. So um, Todd, I know you've already got one or two of those MP3s. Um, It is through repeated use that you get benefit. And of course, there's more we can do. So anybody working with me one-on-one, obviously there's some more processes we can do around sleep, anger, and anxiety. Everything is worse when you're tired. You don't have to have PTSD for that to be the truth, huh? You can just be a parent or a worker or, you know, trying to run a business or being a single mum or dad. There's a lot of, a lot of sleep deprived people in the world. Yeah, yeah, road rage is I think a result of a sleep deprivation. So I want to finish up today, unless anybody that is still online and thank you again for joining me. Um, unless anybody has any questions, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and have a shower and have myself some dinner. So please look after yourselves. I am annoyingly constantly available. Um, I do generally not respond to messages via Facebook after 10 p.m. at night just because I needed to set my boundary. Um, But if I feel that it is urgent, I will still respond. I am not a crisis counsellor. I am not going to talk anybody down from um, doing something silly, which is the euphemism for taking their own life. 
Um, there are much better equipped people to do that. Uh, so please call Lifeline or Men's Line or any of those other um, uh, phone numbers available on the internet if you are in a crisis situation. If you are a family member or a carer of somebody in a crisis situation, then please call triple zero. Okay, if, if it's not uh, a time frame that is going to work for one of those other lines, just call triple zero if you're in Australia. Um, if you are a family member of somebody who is suffering with PTSD or going through the challenges of PTSD and related uh, conditions, I encourage you to practice compassion for yourself, for your loved one, for your children, and try and find the gap and put in the curiosity and turn a reaction into a response. I do hope that this has been of value to some of you, to someone. Uh, thank you, Todd, for telling me that uh, you enjoy listening to it. Um, I honestly could talk about this for hours. Um, a podcast is one of the options that I'm looking at for next year. So if you think that you would like to listen to me in your ears um, while you are on public transport or safely driving uh, to and from work, obviously that's discreet, it's confidential, nobody has to know what you're listening to. Uh, so if you think that that would be beneficial and I should create that for you, please let me know. Uh, it is one of the things that I've been looking at for next year. So if a podcast explaining a couple of these concepts would be beneficial, um, give me some feedback on that. Also, if you haven't already, uh, I'm going to pop some links below. Uh, if you haven't signed up to my mailing list, I encourage you to do so. And in all honesty, I haven't really done very much with it for the last two years. That's all going to change. Um, so I am currently setting up at least, uh, it's not going to be overwhelming. I'm not going to be that person that spams your mailbox. All right. But probably at this stage, I'm looking at monthly and then fortnightly messages. And they're really going to be stuff that is going to add value. That is going to grow your awareness, grow your understanding and increase those options that maybe you didn't even know that you had. So um, I'll chuck some links in the comments box and on, on the business page. Um, so I do encourage you to hop on there and join the mailing list. Once I've got it all set up, I'll put that in uh, because there will be some really good information that I'll be sharing via that list and uh, things like special offers and stuff for the weekend away. So I'm really excited for the weekend in May, with 17th, 18th and 19th of May. If you think that is for you, then get in touch. Uh, there will be pricing and stuff going up before the end of the week and of course payment plans and the like are available because I'm about removing stress from your life not adding stress to your life. Cool, I've been saying goodbye for about 20 minutes which is very typical of me and sending you all love, light and healing and understand that a full recovery is possible, management is not good enough. So, um... I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye for now.